I'm Ryan. And I'm Andrew from the Dad.io podcast, a podcast member of the Gonna Geek Network. Just like the show you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. Check out all the other podcasts at gonnageeknetwork.com. And get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. You are listening to the Starling Tribune, a podcast dedicated to the Arrow TV show. I am the Green Arrow. This podcast is not produced or maintained by the CW, Warner Brothers Television, CTV, or DC Comics. All characters, situations, and stories are the properties of Time Warner. I am the Oracle, and this is your Tribune. Welcome back to Earth 2's favorite newspaper. We call it the Starling Tribune. I am the chief editor tonight. My name is SP and your other award-winning reporters for this episode number 221 of the Starling Tribune are Chris. We're friends with her now? Yeah, really frenemies. And Michelle. You probably shouldn't be shooting people your first week out of prison. Good point. Everybody, this podcast is recorded on Thursday, December 6, 2018, live on www.geeks.live. That's right. And tonight on Geeks.live, we'll be discussing Arrow, as well as news, interviews, articles, and announcements that have dropped in the last week that could and very well will impact future episodes of Arrow, as well as The Flash, Supergirl, Legends of Tomorrow, Black Lightning, and whatever other shows they come up with, because they're always coming up with new ones, it seems like. If you're new to the show, thank you for searching us out on the internet and joining us. After the show, you can check out our content at GunnerGeek.com, where you can also find other geeky videos, podcasts, and articles. Woohoo! Come by Geeks.Live and join the live chat as we record. And thank you very much, Michelle and Chris, for getting us started. And now let's just get into this great episode of Unmask, Michelle. Yes, this episode's called Unmask. It's Season 7, Episode 8. It aired Monday, December 3rd, 2018. It's directed by Alexandra LaRoche. Credits include two episodes of Arrow, two Legends, one Supergirl, three Flash, and two Eureka. Eureka! Written by Oscar Balderrama. Credits include 17 episodes of Arrow. And Beth Schwartz, who is the current showrunner, has written 26 episodes of Arrow and two Legends. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is basically the mid-season finale because we're going to get the crossover and that's it right correct Hence okay our cliffhanger at the end yes we did get one we'll talk about that later first before we get to the rest of the episode we're going to talk about the ratings of this show and all the other dc shows for the week on sunday the 2nd of december supergirl aired the eighth episode of the fourth season titled bunker hill to a live rating of 1.26 still not really getting into the season of supergirl i guess it's just me and then Monday, this episode of Arrow aired to a live rating of 1.35, which is pretty good, a bit better than Supergirl on Sunday. And then following this, Legends of Tomorrow had their seventh episode of the fourth season titled Hell No, Dolly, with a live rating of 0.93. They're still hovering just underneath that one. So it's not like they're going to half a million or below where some other shows like Defiance and The Expanse found themselves. And... On Tuesday, The Flash aired the eighth episode of the fifth season titled What's Past is Prologue. It was the hundredth episode of the show, and it earned a live rating of 1.78. So not above two, but fear not. Next week is the crossover, and it'll be closer to four, I think. And then following Flash, Black Lightning aired the eighth episode of the second season titled The Book of Rebellion, Chapter 1, Exodus, to a live rating of 0.96. And that's just about where that show has been so, guys, any surprises for you? Chris, what do you think? I'm kind of bummed to see the Legends rating. Now, I, I fully admit I'm part of the problem, being that I'm four episodes behind right now. But, man, sub one. That hurts. And it's only going to yeah. get worse when they take, what, their three-month hiatus? Yeah. Michelle, did you see this episode? Yes. And it's really funny. I, I love the play on... The title because there's an you know hello Do dolly and so hell no dolly i just love how they do that with the titles this year like they did last year it was fun you learn more about constantine but again these shows get at least a million bump with the dvr plus seven um and again app views so i don't think it's just as dire as it seems yeah 
in this episode of Arrow, I mean, the, the ratings are actually pretty good. They've, they've been at least stabilizing, if not going up a little bit for Arrow. So I'm glad to see that. I think the word's getting out that this season's a lot better. And I have a theory about the end of the season, which we might have to get into probably the last thing that we talk about for the episode before we say our farewells. So with that out of the way, we're going to talk about Unmasked here. And we often start talking about Unmasked or any episode in terms of the overall theme. We link the overall theme to the title of the episode, which in this case was Unmasked. Michelle, what do you got for me with that? Well, first, we finally learn who the fake green arrow is. And we'll talk about that later. That was amazing. And of course, Oliver is out of prison and he actually dons his Green Arrow outfit without the mask. And he ends up working as a consultant for the police department. I loved Curtis's little remark about the mentalist. My mom loved that show. I can't believe my mom and Curtis have something in common. Uh, so, yeah, I, I really would like to start with Oliver and him in this episode. What do we think of this whole new development of him being hired by Dinah to be a consultant. Well, it kind of makes sense. He needs something to do. And uh, if you look at his skill set, he's not really a great politician, we learned. He's not really a great bar club, uh, nightclub owner. He's pretty good at going out and kicking the butts of bad guys and bringing them in. So working for the police, it's a good way to do it. And that kind of Gets him back out there on the streets doing what he does best. I mean, arguably, he probably doesn't have to wear the Green Arrow costume, but it's fun to see him out there, especially without the hood on and without the mask on. Put a little fear in people. Might be a little Batman-esque. What I'm noticing with Oliver so far post-prison, post-slab side, is he is very level-headed. He's very reserved. He's still quick to action when he needs to, but it's like he's feeling out what his limits are right now. And he really doesn't want to push boundaries. And that's what my assessment was from him this episode. Now, if you take after the crossover and into next year, when we deal with maybe possibly some new characters and not to mention the secrets that are going on in Argus right now, I think he might be a little bit more reactionary. But right now, I think it just took all he had just to put the suit back on and get out there. And oh my gosh, he was classic Green Arrow. It, this was Green Arrow at probably the best that we've seen him. So I'm really excited to have our Green Arrow back. Guys, is it me or did we just get our third hallway fight of the season? Right, SP? I know you're a fan of the hallway fight as I as I am. This is the third one, right? The one with I, Talia, then last week. With the dual deck fight, yeah. Yeah, and then this one in the club. Right. I watched this one, and it was a, some great choreography. And I did notice the quick cuts, and I have been noticing a lot more stuntmen. And I think stuntmen this week are probably more likely. I mean, I was expecting it because of the crossover, just because the actors are filming three episodes instead of just one episode. So I have no idea what kind of scheduling mayhem that is for the actors. I think they pulled this off really well, considering, and it has me a little bit cringing that the crossover might be a little bit degraded from it. But I don't know. We'll wait until next se uh, next week season no we'll wait until next week to see what's going on which by the way i've said it before last year and i just want to reiterate it going into the crossover for next week this might be the last crossover with arrow involved or the last crossover as we know it so let's savor it and we'll talk about that later is it just me or does anyone else think the stunt team is going oh man he's not wearing a mask and a hood now crap <laughs> whoever the stunt man is has a head that is similar to Oliver. I haven't seen pictures, so I haven't gone out and done the research, but I can definitely see a resemblance, but you never actually see the face. So you clearly know when a stunt man is out there because the camera work is such that the stunt man is just, you can't, I mean, you might get a glance of an eye or a glance of the tip of the nose, but you never get the side of the face when it goes 
onto the stuntman. That's a good point, Chris, with him being unmasked. They really got to pick that stunt devil carefully. Well, I mean, it's part of the problem they had. We'll talk Marvel here for a second with Daredevil is they had to try and smartly work around things whenever Matt was in fight scenes, not wearing either the black mask or the red devil costume because there's a lot more face exposed. So it's the same problem they're going to have here, I would think, that you've got all of Stephen Amell's face exposed, so you can't get away with the guy that looks close enough at a mask. I think he was doing some of his own stunts even at the beginning when they were going after the new Green Arrow in that warehouse area. And he was jumping around pretty sprightly. I mean, he has competed as, what was that, American Ninja Warrior, Chris? That's true. He did do the celebrity version. Though, of course, he did wear a beanie, which might help with sneaking a stunt person in there, too. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, there was a stunt guy that did some of that poor core stuff, which was awesome. Yeah, I'm glad to see the action back in this uh, season. They're not, they're not holding back. They're not doing the character development episodes as non-action episodes. I mean, there's action in every single episode. So that's the core of Arrow, and I'm glad that Beth Schwartz gets it. I'm glad that the production team of each and every episode, Alexander LaRoche was excellent to actually come in and direct this episode, and Oscar Balderrama, who's been just a stalwart on this show, they really shined and they really came out and and made this episode a lot because this episode couldn't it, it might have not have been as good as it was, you know, given like if it was a season four episode. But they they did it. They came through in what is, uh, oh, let's just get through this episode to get to the crossover. Oh, no, this was a hard hitting one. We learned a lot of great stuff. And I mean, it was great. No Christmas party, but it was still great. One of the things that came up. Was. This is the anniversary of Felicity barging in on Barry and Iris's <laughs> perfect, beautiful little park ceremony. Yes, it is their first year anniversary. And things aren't going very well, are they, Chris? No, uh, they kind of have a conflict over the how things have changed. And there's that lingering resentment from Oliver making a decision seven months ago without consulting anyone to go to jail and how she had to change because of that. And Oliver is not exactly comfortable with the new Felicity he's seeing right now. And we kind of got teased with that last week when Diaz told Oliver that Felicity was going to kill him and he didn't really believe it. And now Oliver's starting to see, hmm, she's got a gun from Anatoly. She doesn't hesitate to put a round in this guy that breaks into our apartment. And she doesn't really exactly seem repentant or really bothered by that fact which is not quite like the woman he knew seven months ago when he went into jail what did he expect honestly what what did he expect when you have a bunch of people that are going to be after your family because what you've done for the last six years and then you go away and you can't be involved in protecting them and you've basically taken away all of their protection by making a deal to take all the vigilantes off the table. So Team Arrow is no more, basically. Well, to be fair, I think his expectation is that Argus would be able to protect them. Now, uh, us having seen this show for seven years now, no, that's fairly unrealistic. But if you're Oliver, you're thinking, gee, my best friend, my brother, and all but blood works for Argus. His wife's the director. They should be able to keep my family safe. Was a realistic thing? No. But remember, Oliver was desperate last season to try and find a way out. So he took a desperation leap, and that's how we got where we are. I like how the curtains were lined with. Looked like chain like, mail. <laughs> chain mail. <laughs> That's really cool. I want some of those. I'm and sure she, you could get them or make them. Yeah. It takes forever yeah. to make chain mail, though. I don't have that much free time. Just take away all the time that you're playing Spider Man 4 and Red Dead the Redemption. I haven't played any 76. Red Dead Redemption. Oh, I've played some of that. And yeah. don't, don't forget <laughs> Pokemon also, and then Super Smash Brothers tomorrow when it comes in. I have a problem, guys. I have a problem. Yeah, you have time in your schedule for chain mail curtains. I, I don't blame Felicity either. I mean, she had. she's right. She had to learn how to survive and protect herself and William from Diaz, who's still out there and everything so conversely do you all blame oliver for taking the deal he made to save everyone at the end of last season because that's what started all of this if he would have talked to some people if he would have talked to felicity i think they could have come up with some other option but i think ultimately what he did was probably the best option 
See, I, he just I, didn't talk to anybody about it. I think it. so too. And honestly, I think the not talking was a conscious decision. Everyone's always like, Oliver doesn't like to communicate things. I think he knew that if he talked to people about what this plan is, they would find a way to talk him out of it. And there was no way, there was nothing else he knew to get the problem solved, to save everyone. And I think he was afraid of getting talked out of it. Because you got to imagine, he probably didn't really want to go to prison. It's just, this was all he could do. When has a secret ever turned out well on the show? Um, never. That's right. You think Oliver would have learned by now. Speaking of secrets, Lila and Diggle are working on a little project and it's about that painting and they find out that it's tied to the longbow hunters we actually speculated if the longbow hunters were going to come back or not and it seems like they might and those two without telling oliver and felicity again talk about secrets they go see diaz and they ask him for his help this is not going to go well no but at the same time I don't think they have to tell Oliver and Felicity because they work for Argus. It's an Argus op. It's something that came out of that, that one could argue Felicity and Oliver have no need to know to be involved in this operation. Yeah. Now, I'm siding with Chris on this one because yeah. if it was a uh, FBI or a CIA in the real world or DEA or you know, ATF, you pick your secret service, whatever in the United States, you pick your federal organization, even IRS, they have no need to know what goes on there now i agree it's diaz you would think you'd want to tell your friends what's going on but yeah i i think they're in a position where oh gosh i can't believe i'm actually defending a secret on the show they're in a position where they don't know who to trust about this information because they are even breached inside argus so i can see them wanting to keep it secret they're practicing good opsec basically is what's yeah. going on here is they're running the op tight we all know it's going to fall apart around them they're going to have to bring oliver and felicity in there's going to be words exchanged potentially fists exchanged but right now you think though, that there will be a hoss involved we haven't gotten many hosses this season so i'm kind of bummed we've gotten any hosses but this, this has been a hoss free season and you uh, no just... they've already recorded the next few episodes whatever okay anyway when they went to Diaz and was like, we need your help because they saw something and that they needed, like, they're so like scared or desperate that they need to go to him. Well, I mean, Diaz Cr is the closest thing they have to an expert on the longbow hunters. But, I mean, I think that's what drives that is they know he hired them. He worked with them for a while to fulfill his goals. And they gave him a special gift on their way out the door to basically shut down communications in the prison. So there's a relationship of some kind that they can at least try and exploit to learn more. I don't know who else they would go to to find out about the longbow hunters. I think that was the play. It might be just as simple as contacting them and being the, kind of like they use Curtis, right, for the buy. They might be trying to use Diaz for that, but you know it's not going to go well. So oh, it's going to go real bad, real oh, bad. And and we're right, right? Because we all said that Kirk was coming back, and we got him. So yay, Diaz is back. I'm just glad they're going to bring back the longbow hunters because I think they're cool. I was wrong about that. <laughs> Didn't we? We said that we were not going to get them until the end of the season, if at all. So yeah, I was wrong about that one. I'll I'll take that one. Keeping in the present, we finally figure out, well, we're, we're not figure out. We're, we're just told right there at the beginning of the episode. We see this woman. She has this amazing workout routine. She has her protein shake. And we're all like, who is this? And she suits up and we get Amiko is the fake green arrow. Well, we don't know for sure that's her name. We're just speculating. But, you know, if you go on the comic lore, yes, I, I would say that this is, and I've always thought it was pronounced Emiko, but I guess it's pronounced Amiko. I've heard both pronunciations. I'm not sure which is right. Okay. I ping pong back and forth in my head between them, I'll be honest. I'm sure the show will tell us in January. <laughs> More than likely. I mean, I do hope they keep that name. Uh, I don't want them to change it. 
because it has such a great connection to the comics. And I know this show has veered from comic book lore, and that's great. But to be able to just bring in a little bit from the comic book again into the show, I thought it was great. And I love that it's a woman. It's been a long time since we've done any sort of comic book checklist with the show, whether it's the bat checklist, comic book checklist, something like that. Yeah, it's great. And yes, uh, the new Green Arrow is a woman. So I was thrown off by Talia being a woman and the new Green Arrow being about that height. And I was also uh, um, given false uh, visual cues about the green quiver that Talia had. But this is great. I didn't I did not see this coming. Chris, did you see this coming? Nope. I found out before the episode aired just because of set pictures that had come out. And I went, oh, that's cool. But it's not anything I had predicted now. I love her workout routine. So we don't get a salmon ladder, but we get rings. I'm all for this. This is great. Now, if we get a salmon ladder back, and like if they try to rehab the rehab, the uh, the bunker, I'm all for that and bringing the salmon ladder back in. But if we just get the rings a little bit more this season, I'm all for that. That was awesome training at the beginning. Because have you guys ever tried to do that? That takes a heck of a lot of upper body strength. No, I haven't. Although I did see Tom Holland post an Instagram video of himself doing the rings. And I was like, damn, how the hell do these guys do that? Because like you could just see every muscle on his arm bulging too. So same within this training sequence. I was like, how the hell? You must have some ridiculous body control. And speaking of another woman who can fight... In the flash forward, we meet Black Star. Black Star is not a place, not an op. It's a woman. SP, what did you think of uh, her introduction? I think she heals up pretty fast because didn't she get like hit on the side of the head? And then we didn't really see that much of blood later or anything. So that's awesome. I did watch a fight at the beginning. It was really cool watching her fight. And she was able to use her body mass to her advantage which uh, it's kind of stereotypical in fights with women versus men that they use their body weight and their legs as their main weapons and i hope they go beyond that with black star but i'm glad to see that she at least is capable of doing all that stuff or at least her stunt person is capable of doing all that stuff it was a good fight to watch with her i still have to scratch my head about what's going on I paid close attention to the dialogue all the way around and Dinah and Zoe could still be responsible for Felicity's quote unquote death. I don't believe she's dead at all, but I think that could be there. And I think black star could be working for Felicity. And there's this whole thing about these plans and why does Felicity want to blow up everything? Maybe Felicity was trying to prevent it. I don't know. One would think, yeah. I mean, we, we would assume she's probably not trying to blow things up, but God knows how weird things are in the glades. And we'll find out soon, it sounds like, but there's been kind of a flip of how things work in Star City. Yeah, it. the way Black Star was talking, it seems as though something Dinah does caused everything. SP, you're right. I finally did see the scar on Dinah's neck. It seems as though somebody did try to, you know, take out the voice of the canary. I'm going to have to give that one to Chris. I just agreed with him that I thought there might be a scar there, but Chris was the one who pointed it out. Yeah, I saw it this week too, and I had a note. I was like, hey, at least it's true. We can confirm it, which I think is cool, and I'm really curious to hear the story behind that. We also learn about the mark of four. Um, Oliver came up with it before everything. is supposed to be the four pillars of heroism, courage, compassion, selflessness, and loyalty the way Dinah was talking like to William like your father had this way your father came up with this it almost makes it seems as though Oliver is either gone or dead I think that's the implication they're trying to give us is that Oliver they want us to think he's dead I think I think it was probably more along the lines of gone because I can't imagine them not giving us a green arrow of the future because yeah. it would be a really cool moment on screen. So I'm going to give a little bit of my theory about the future of the show. So in the initial contracts way back when, six and a half years ago, whenever, 
Stephen Amell was signed to a seven year deal, basically, or I don't know how they do it in Hollywood, but they had options up to seven years. So after this year, I don't know if Stephen Amell is going to be part of this show. This flash forward could be an attempt for the show to move it forward so that the show could still go on next year, but in the future. And then you take out a lot of the main characters without killing them, you know, just or maybe killing them, one of the two, but I, I just don't see the death of Oliver Queen being the end of this. So I think it's looking more and more right now that next year Stephen Amell will not be on the show and that they will move forward with either another Green Arrow or Into the Future or something. I just see them setting it up at this point. And it seems some of the seeds in this episode have been planted. Dinah actually mentions to Renee, hey, have you considered running for office? And then we learn that Renee is in charge of the Glades. And as we know, you know, Renee's passionate about the Glades and wanting to help the people of the Glades. Yeah, I could see that. I could see him the king of the Glades, basically. And I could see him putting up the walls. I could see him being instrumental in all that. I don't think he was a bystander. I think he was right there in the middle of everything. That would be cool to see Zoe and an aged Renee. It seems as well to what we're going to need to get when the show comes back. And there's going to be something off with Renee. Something is broken there because his daughter does not exactly seem enthused to go see Renee. Well, maybe he called her Hoss a lot. Hoss a lot. Is that like an <laughs> ocelot that says Hoss? Hoss? I'm sure. I knew exactly what you were going to say as oh soon as I God. said Oh my God, guys, I want a Hoss a lot. Can yeah. someone draw us one? Like, if anyone's got any talent, draw us a Hoss a lot and tweet it to at Starling Tribune or email it to us or something. This sounds amazing. I must see it. Well, before we go further into the show and, and move on to another segment, <laughs> Chris... So is there anything else about the episode you would like to discuss? I don't even know anymore. All I can think about is a freaking hoss a lot. <laughs> so no, I no, I'm broken now. Curtis had very little screen time this episode, but I think that was in consolation to him being highlighted a couple of weeks ago, like the France when he was playing the, the doctor, the French doctor or whatever. And we don't know, what kind of role he was playing during the crossover. So he might have had a lot of scenes he had to go do that. But I did notice Curtis wasn't there. Yes, Chris? I remember what I was going to say now. The mayor. What do we think? Good thing? Bad thing? Are they are they on the side of good? Are they evil manipulating things? Or are they just having a, an authority figure there that Dinah can rebel against? Is that the purpose of the mayor? I'm going to say she's good. I'm going to say she's acting in what she thinks is the best interest of the city. I think the city... Yeah, look, look at politics over the course of this century in the United States. You're always being reactionary to what's going on around you. And in this particular case, they've been lied to. They've had their government decimated. And now they can definitely blame vigilantes for a lot of this. I mean, I can see some people saying, well, we wouldn't have had all these problems with these criminals that came in to destroy the city if you guys weren't vigilantes here. So that is still pervasive here. I'm kind of glad they're not going in that direction because I think that's what's detracting me from like Supergirl this year and to an extent Black Lightning as well. But it's definitely at the point where I think she is not meaning harm. She is meaning good. Now, is she doing the right thing or not? I don't know. That's the question, if she's doing the right thing or not. I think she's allowing it. I mean, she could have fired Dinah on the spot and she didn't. So that's at least good. I mean, maybe the mayor, as much as the mayor is grumbling, kind of sees the benefit of, hmm, the green arrow is working for the police to help get things cleaned up now. This might be a good thing. Is he going to get a badge? Oh my God. Can we put a badge on his suit? Like Dinah had her coat as they were going into the uh, police station and her badge was on the belt of the I mean that looked really good that that was awesome whoever made that costume for Dinah Drake that was awesome with the badge right there oh loved it great now all I can see is an hoss a lot 
And Oliver with a little bitty shiny badge on his chest that glints. He's like trying to be all like stealth. And all of a sudden the light hits the badge and it gives his position away. What was his badge number? Would that be? Would it be four, five, eight, seven? Would oh, it be God. 52? Be awesome. What would it be? What was his badge number be? There's got to be some like major issue from the comics or something. They would model it after. I don't know. Okay. So an I, issue number. Yeah. It'd be an issue number is what I'm thinking. Okay. Now here's the real question is, is, is he just a consultant long-term or does he eventually become like deputized for lack of a better term to have arrest powers and things like that? Cause right now he's basically just a weapon that they can point at and say, go get those people and bring them to us so we can arrest them. We don't have a detective on the show anymore. We have captain, sure. right? We have captain Drake. So I think it would be great to have detective green arrow. It'd be like Mrs. Green Arrow, but Detective Green Arrow. I think that would work. I like it. There we go. Well, we'll find out when Arrow comes back in January, because this is technically the mid-season finale, because next week is the big old crossover. Um, Elseworlds It will actually air Sunday, December 9th, these, um, Monday, December 10th, and Tuesday, December 11th. I believe we plan on covering uh, the entire crossover because it's going to be very difficult to just talk about part two without talking about one and three. Yep, we're going to talk about the whole thing. The Arrow-specific one is part two. That one is going to be directed by our favorite, James Banford. Bam, bam! And, um, teleplay was by uh, Mark Guggenheim, and the story is by Carolyn Dries. I don't know. What do you guys think about Mark Guggenheim being the writer behind this one? He's done pretty good for crossovers because he does know like the comic book stuff and this, such. Yeah, this is the big picture you've got to look at here. So you're not really going down into the weeds of anything that's probably going to impact the regular things we've been seeing this year. Because the crossover may have minor impacts across things, but it's not going to change the plot greatly, I wouldn't think. Watch, I All say right. that yeah. they're going to kill someone off now. <laughs> they could. Who knows? I just put All the right. kiss of death on someone, and I don't know who. It's not going to be anybody in Legends of Tomorrow, because they're not part of it. No, they'll probably just make them show up long enough to kill them. Actually, before we move on, I just want to say Legends of Tomorrow, I've been lamenting the fact that they're not going to be part of the crossover all season since they announced the crossover and they said that Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. was not going to be part of it. I did halfway enjoy the reason why they're not because if you watched last week's episode there's some things going on in their universe which do not translate over into the crossover it would have been impossible for them to bring over so i i hope they do both really well i hope they do the legends of tomorrow really well because this will be a mid-season finale for them and i hope they do the crossover well so we'll see next week looking forward to it in the meantime, we actually received some feedback this week, and I want to point out that we do indeed have an email address. It's starlingtribune at gmail.com. Once again, starlingtribune, all one word, no the at the front, just starlingtribune at gmail.com. Got this email, and I'm just going to read it to you guys. Hey, guys, I love your show as always. There are a few thoughts I have and wanted to get your opinion on it as well. I think Black Star is actually Oliver and Felicity's daughter. It makes sense, as she is super intelligent like Felicity and a great fighter like Oliver. I wonder who is Emiko's mother. My obvious thought is Ravager. Considering her combat abilities and the history of Rav Ravager and Robert, but I could be wrong. If that is the case, then why was Ravager's daughter never mentioned in Season 2? Thank you for the insight, David. So, Michelle, I think you did some research into this. Yeah, let's first talk about um, Ravager and who Amiko's mother could be. Um, in the comics, Ravager is Rose Wilson, who is typically Slade, Slade Wilson's daughter, Deathstroke, one of our favorites. Um, when you go into the show, um, Isabel Rochef um, would basically be Ravager equivalent when it comes to the show. In the comics, Amiko is the daughter of Robert and Shadow, who is an assassin. IGN actually has a nice um, write-up on 
Amico Queen and her history and everything. And I put a link in the show notes. But so considering that we've already had a shadow on the show, in this, you know, in this case, when it comes to the show, it could almost be anybody. They could introduce somebody interesting. It could be China White. I don't know. Um, but obviously, Robert is a father you see at the end of the episode. She's there talking to the, the grave and talking as though she actually knew Robert, saying that, you know, Oliver is a lot like you and more than I expected and such. So I think it's interesting that we, we Oliver has a half sister, you know, from his mom, and now he's going to get a half sister from his dad. And I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, th these queens sure got around, it seems like. <laughs> they did indeed. So, first of all, I love the burned out shell of the Queen Mansion just reminding us what happened. I don't think they've ever actually showed it on the show, though. I think this is the first time we've seen, no, I'm sorry, there was that whole scene where the whole no and my think of the comic i'm getting mixed up about season uh 2.5 in the comics and what we've seen on the show we yeah. haven't seen the queen manor burn down have i we? thought they just had to sell it but when oliver went broke or something like that and they all moved out i didn't remember it burning down which doesn't mean that that hasn't happened it's very possible i just forgot and didn't have time to research well, the comic book that we read for this show was season 2.5, and that was before Michelle came on the show. And the Queen Manor was burned down in that comic book, and that comic book was considered canon by Mark Guggenheim, so it was then labeled canon. I just don't remember if we saw it actually burning or not on the screen. I mean, seven years, guys. I can't remember every single thing that happened on the show, especially at my age, but... It was great that we got reminded of that. It was great that we saw the grave site. So that was all cool. It does bring into the question, who's the mom? And who's the mom? The two moms. And I think this is going to be important as we go forward. And I want to go back to the episode a little bit. And I was going to save this until now. I think this season has done a great job of giving us mysteries as we go along and we're speculating on these mysteries. And then when we get them, it's just enough to say, okay, that is it for the mystery. Like Felicity's dead or what is the symbol of the four or anything else or who's the new green arrow, that sort of thing. And when we get the answer, there's more to the story. You're like, okay, so we found out what that is, but then what does it mean? I think this is one of those cases where it's like, okay, we know that Emiko's here, but who's the mom? Who's the mom? And what does it mean? What is she trying to do in the city? Because she was actually helping out old team arrow and in her statements, she, it, I don't know what exactly you could dissect her statements as she said at the gravesite, and you could take it one of two ways. My guess was that when they publicized the fact that Oliver queen was going to jail for being the green arrow, she came in to continue that legacy or something along those lines. I don't know what. As for the mother for Emiko, I don't think it's going to end up being Ravager in this case. I just don't think the times line up quite right for that. But I think it will come into play in some way, shape, or form. We'll see in the future. Or they might not ever address it. and just It could end up being a throwaway thing. Similar to what they did in Star Wars with Ray. Like, Ray must be important. Ray must be important. Uh, her parents were nobodies. Well, that's what we heard in two. We'll see yeah. in three. Or... That's what we heard in eight. We'll see if in nine. If Fair that's point. True. So I don't know that the mother part is actually going to matter, but it's interesting mystery. The, the Ravager stuff is more intriguing. And once not Ravager, excuse me, the uh, Black Star stuff rather is what's more intriguing. Once we figure out who exactly she is, maybe it's Talia. It'd be interesting. Probably not, but just throwing that out there. You're right. It could be absolutely anybody. Do we think Black Stars Felicity's? kid i don't i mean how would nobody know that all i mean all these people they're so intertwined in each other's lives grant the future is obviously going to change things to some extent but how would nobody know that would be awkward talking about star wars that could present an issue with william and black star in the future like maybe they kiss and they find out that they're half brother and half sister Ew. At least it's only half instead of fulls like it was in Star Wars. 
makes it slightly less gross. <laughs> well, it okay. So in this episode, Felicity and Oliver seem to be on the rocks. Felicity keeps talking about her new security system. We've had smoke technologies hinted at. If if Felicity and Oliver divorce and let's say she ended up going out of town i mean maybe she could have the kid and give it up for adoption or raise it in secret or something or whatever i mean it's possible yeah i mean i just it seems it's the same thing you have with star wars not everything can be about the skywalker family at some oh, point no, no, don't you dare say that. Everything is about the Skywalker right. family. But, but they're making a point of trying to move away from that. And excuse me for making the Star Wars parallel here, guys. I'm not trying to cross the streams, but it makes a little bit of sense. They can't make everything be about Oliver Queen and the Queen family in this case. I, I think I'd like it more if Black Star was just some random person who maybe was mentored by Felicity or something like that. There's a relationship there, but it's not like actual blood relationship. She did call herself the calculator. That's true moving on to that parental role perhaps i think they very much want us to think that 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 she is the daughter of felicity and possibly Oliver queen or someone else i think that's what they want us to think i'm not sure i'm ready to bite on that one yet yeah we'll continue to speculate until we know for sure yeah. it, it, they did they did their job rather they're making everyone kind of scratch their head and be like, wonder who she is and put all the theories out there and the conspiracy theories and theories that everyone have are great. It's a fun exercise. I enjoy it a lot. Malcolm's still on the table. Yeah. Roy's still. Well, could be Roy's daughter. Wow. Uh, Roy daughter of Roy and Thea, maybe. Yeah. Which we still don't know gets why. Down the queen path, but I like that. We don't know why Roy went to the island. He doesn't want to talk about the past. He doesn't even want to talk about Thea. And they couldn't take him to the club because if he was recognized, now granted, they're not assuming Black Star would recognize him, but if he's recognized there, it'd be a problem. So there's obviously some additional Roy Harper backstory we haven't gotten yet that's going to come into play. I missed him this episode in the flash forwards. I don't think we're going to get him next week in the crossover, so we'll have I to wait till not. January. Yeah. But I have to admit, this season has really gotten off to a strong start, so good job, Beth. Yes, Beth, thank you very much for taking the job and doing as well as you have. It's fixing and things and ignoring Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people are ignoring Tumblr right now. And also, I just want to say thank you to David for that great email feedback. Keep it coming. Yes, thank you, David. Well, we are not the only podcast that talks about things on the GonnaGeek.com network. We have about, we have over 20 podcasts on this network. Chris, what's one of them? Yeah, so each week we try to highlight one specific show because as much as we'd love to, we can't talk about all the shows in the network because we'd be here all night and we wouldn't be talking about Arrow. But what we can do is we can highlight one show and say, hey, maybe this week you guys should go check out Game Life Balance US. In this case, episode 56 entitled Balancing Not One, but two kids. Jonathan Martin returns to the podcast. After a five-month hiatus from podcasting, Jonathan Martin returns to the show with an update on his game life balance. He talks about welcoming a second son into his family and catches up with Cody on some of the video games they've been playing. Plus, get a sneak peek at the video games they plan on talking about in the next few episodes. The show is back. So welcome back, guys, and congratulations, Jonathan Martin, on the birth of your second son. Yeah, and congratulations, Jonathan, for podcasting with a podcast award winner now, too. It's all because of Jonathan that Cody became a podcast award winner. He I shaped not, Cody. I do not dispute that one iota. So congratulations, Jonathan, for shaping your protege into winning an award. So that award is like 33% John Martin's, I say. Just saying. 30, I, I would say like 66%. Oh, okay, we'll go with that. I'm fine with that. Cody's never going to know. We're just nope. going to take two-thirds of that trophy and give it to Jonathan. 
Yeah, dang right. <laughs> so, guys, I think that is going to start us on the path of wrapping up the show. So a big thank you to our live listeners who tuned in at Geeks.Live and participate in the chat room. But also a thank you to those of you that download the audio podcast at a later date from StarlingTribune.com. Don't forget, you can find the podcast online. You can also catch the replays of this over on the Gunna Geek YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash Gunna Geek. If you happen to have an Amazon device, and I just picked up a couple of new Amazon Dot third generations, they sound pretty good, actually, you can enable our podcast as a skill. Just say your activation word and enable Starling Tribune and skill, and it will come up, and you can have full play uh Go back and forth, full play control. It's pretty cool there. Also, we now have a Discord server at www.guineageek.com slash Discord, and we are having a lot of fun chat on there about this very show, Arrow. Remember, you can always catch us live as we record at www.geeks.live in our chat room at 7.30 p.m. Eastern or 4.30 p.m. Pacific on Thursdays. We would love to hear from you. We are the Starling Tribune on Facebook and Instagram, at Starling Tribune on Twitter, and you can call us at 612-888-CAVE. That's 612-888-2283. Well, this brings us to the end of another great episode. Any last words before we sign off? At Stargate Pioneer. Hashtag Detective Green Arrow. At the Chris Farrell. Hashtag Bring Me a Hosselot. And I am at Michelle Ely signing off with hashtag oh Hosselot. <laughs> I love it when I break my co-host. It's why I did not write it down in the show notes. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Heather. Um, Pull it together, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> And I am at Michelle Ely signing off with hashtag Mark of the Four. Oracle, I think we're done here. This was the Starling Tribune. You can leave us feedback at gunnageek.com or check out our archive at starlingtribune.com. Visit gunnageek.com for more podcasts. Music by Kevin McLeod can be found at incompetech.com. This podcast is not produced or maintained by the CW, Warner Brothers Television, CTV, or DC Comics. All characters, stories, and situations are the property of Time Warner. No infringement is intended. We will see you for the next episode of CW's Arrow. serious someone someone bring me a hoss lot i really want it Bye, now guys. now i know what oliver queen's going to be doing after this season you know he's not going to be doing the green arrow he's going to be detective green arrow you know the the law abiding uh thing he needs a sidekick though who's going to be a sidekick detective it's not be Pikachu. <laughs> maybe he'll get a turtle as a sidekick they can cross him over with pokemon that's guaranteed money right there detective pikachu no, guys, this We're, is an actual video game. I didn't pull this out of my butt. <laughs> I don't know if Stephen Amell wants to uh, go down the path of, of more juvenile video games and comic Detective books. Detective Pikachu's voiced by Deadpool. Oh, I did not know that. Okay, yep. the, two, the two of them could get down. Yeah, that'd be good. Let's make this happen. You guys heard it here first. Mick Green Arrow's partner, Detective Pikachu. <laughs> Nintendo of America, I know there's the video game awards starting in like four minutes, so I'm sure you've been listening up until that show starts. We want this to happen. Make it happen. I mean, Deb, are you talking about Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool? Ryan Reynolds is the voice of Detective Pikachu. Oh, Stephen Amell, you you still got to do that. That would be a Detective Green Arrow and Detective Pikachu. There's ah. absolutely no way this fails. All of you guys watching live, try and get that out of your mind now, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.